This video is a guide on how to create a blockchain-based web application using Worf. Worf is a collection of new JavaScript SDKs for Antelope blockchains, which were commissioned by the Antelope Coalition of Blockchains, including EOS, Telos, Wax, and UX. My name is Aaron Cox. I'm one of the co-founders of Graymass who helped create Worf. In this tutorial, we're going to use Worf to create a new web application. This web application is going to integrate a smart contract as the backend that has already been deployed to the Jungle 4 testnet. This guide will not cover the development of a smart contract, but the smart contract being used is open source and will be available on GitHub for reference. As a developer following this tutorial, it's expected that you're already going to be familiar with web application development. We're not going to be diving into great detail on how to build web applications and mostly focusing on Worf itself and how to integrate that smart contract backend into a web application. The web application we're going to create in this video is a simple to-do app. While to-do apps are somewhat boring, the exciting part will hopefully be on how to use Worf, how to interact with the blockchain and the development around this, and how easy it can be. Worf is a rather large collection of SDKs and we'll only be covering a small portion of what's available. Primarily, what we'll be using throughout this tutorial is the session kit and the contract kit. The session kit is what helps connect users to your application, and the contract kit is what helps making interact with smart contracts easy. In addition to all of this, we'll also be using the command line tools to generate front-end application code based on your smart contract, and we'll be using a special wallet plugin that allows you to embed a private key and sign transactions locally. When it comes to pushing your application to production and having actual users log in, you can just swap this plugin out for a real wallet plugin that'll integrate with whatever wallet your user is using. One last piece we'll add in is another plugin for the session kit that'll help manage resources for every transaction that you're going to perform during development. We'll include this plugin so you don't have to worry about CPU net and other network resources as you're doing development. As you're following along to these guides, feel free to reference the full source code for this tutorial on GitHub. It is located under the WorfKit organization, and the client code itself is located under the tutorial client code base. The master branch is going to be the completed tutorial with everything already filled out in the application working. To jump to specific chapters, check out the specific branches that correlate to the chapter numbers in this video. Additionally, this is where you will also find the contract, which is located again under the WorkKit organization as the tutorial to do contract. Feel free to reference this if you want to see how the smart contract works, but we won't be going into any more depth about this contract. Now that we have a basic overview of what we're going to do, let's get started. For this example, we're going to use Svelte along with Byte. If you'd prefer to use a different technology stack, feel free to skip this chapter and just get some sort of basic boilerplate website set up. We've set up a branch with Svelte and Byte built into it. So the first step in getting started quickly is just to clone down the repository in a folder you're choosing. Once that's complete, just go into the folder and run yarn or npm install to install the dependencies. Now, just to make sure it's all working, you can either run npm run dev or yarn dev in order to launch the application. It'll give you the host and port that it is running on in your local machine, which you can just open in your web browser. This is what you'll see, a very simple web application with just some text, no controls, Nothing else integrated into it, with the only exception being that we've added Pico CSS for some very basic CSS. This is going to serve as the blank canvas for us to build the to-do application on top of. Before we get any further, though, we're going to need a Jungle 4 testnet account, something to actually perform transactions on the blockchain with. For this, we'll use the WarfKit command line tool. We'll use npx for this, which is just the command that lets you run a package without having to install it globally. Just drop out of your command line prompt, run npx, orfkit, with the at symbol in front, slash cli, which is the name of the package, and then account. What this does is it uses our account creation services to create a Jungle 4 testnet account for you using the private key and public key shown in the command prompt. Copy and save this information somewhere, since it's not saved anywhere else. You can also import this private key into any wallet that supports the Jungle 4 testnet and use it just like any other account. This feature of the command line tool is built for developers to utilize testnets and easily be able to create a new account. 
Now that you have a testnet account of your own, let's start hooking the application up so you can actually log in with that account and perform actions. We're going to add four packages now. First being the WarfKit session, which is the core library that allows users to perform transactions. The second is the web renderer, which is a default user interface that the users can use to log in with. The third is the private key plugin, which we'll use to load the private key from the last step. And the last is the transact plugin resource provider, which takes care of resources on the network and just makes the user experience a little bit better. Let those packages install, and then let's switch back to the code. Create a new file, and we'll just call it wharf. It'll be a TypeScript file. Here's where we're going to add the common functionality that we need in our application for the session kit. Things like logging in, logging out, restoring sessions, and which blockchains it's going to use. We'll also configure the wallet plugin that we installed. To start with, let's just add all the dependencies we know we'll need. This includes a number of things from the session kit, like the blockchains, the session, and the session kit itself. Then we have the transact plugin, the wallet plugin private key, and the web renderer. These are the four packages that we included that will be needed in this step. We can also add the information we know already. This includes the private key that we generated in the previous chapter, as well as the blockchains that we know we'll be connecting to. This chains variable that is exported from the session kit contains a number of predefined blockchains as well as API endpoints. This array can also be populated with an ID and a URL, but for simplicity's sake in this guide, we'll just be using the shorthand. The next thing we'll need is the session kit itself, which is a factory class that's used to create user sessions. We'll export this so it's usable throughout the rest of the app. The first argument passed to the session kit is all of the required variables to make it work. This includes an app name, which is the name of your application, the chains property, which is an array that contains all of the chains that your application will support, the UI property, where we pass in the web renderer we installed earlier, and a property called wallet plugins that is an array of all of the different wallet plugins that your application is going to support. The second parameter of the session kit is all of the optional parameters that you can pass in. For this example, we're going to include the transact plugin resource provider we installed to cover user resources during transaction calls. The next thing we're going to need is some sort of state storage. For this in Svelte, we're just going to declare a variable and export it, and it's either going to be a session or it's going to be undefined. If the user is logged in, we'll have a session saved in this variable, and if they are not logged in, it will be undefined. To make things a little easier on ourselves, instead of using the session kit directly in the application, we're going to create some helper functions to wrap some of the logic of the session kit. The first function we'll define is just a login function, and we'll export it. The first thing this function does is uses the session kit and calls login. We'll await the result, which comes back as a login result and contains information about the process that just occurred. The thing that we're most interested in, though, in this result is the session itself, which we'll just take and assign to our state variable of session. Now, the rest of the application will have access to that session, and we'll be able to tell if the user's logged in and then be able to perform transactions using the account. The next function we'll create is the logout function, which again uses the session kit, this time calling logout, and then just sets the session to be undefined. The last method we'll create is the restore method, in which we'll use the session kit to call restore and just set the session state to whatever it returns. If a session exists, it will be set in the application state, and if no session exists, it'll return undefined one last thing we're going to do in this file to make the application a bit more reactive is take advantage of Svelte stores. We'll include the writable type as well as the writable class from the Svelte store. We'll also change our session export to be a writable store that again can be a session or undefined, and then we'll set it up to be a blank writable. Then instead of just assigning the variable, we'll use session.set and pass in the result in the login, logout, and restore functions. This is Svelte's way of making a variable reactive so the user interface can update immediately. Now let's head on over to the app.svelte file and start hooking all these methods and variables up. The first thing we'll do is import all of the methods and the session store from the WARF file we created. Then in the header, we're going to add an if else statement to check if the session exists or if it's undefined. 
for reference, and svelte, this dollar sign, accesses the value of the store. So if we have a session set, what we're going to do is create a button that, when clicked, calls the logout method. The contents of the button is going to be logout, and then in parentheses show the name of the account that is currently logged in. If there is no session logged in, we'll use the else statement, and then we will create a login button that on click calls the logon method that we created. The last bit of functionality we need to add is to restore a session, which we'll use svelte on mount method. This method will call restore every time the page is loaded. And finally, we'll just add a little bit of CSS at the bottom to align the buttons. With those changes, now if we start the application and switch back to our browser, we'll see that it now has a login button up in the header that will trigger Wharf when clicked. Wharf, using the private key wallet plugin, will automatically look for accounts that use that private key and allow you to select which account you'd like to log in with. Clicking the account will log in the user. The if statement we created switched the login button to a logout button and displays the account name that we're logged in with. Clicking logout will log the user out. Now to check if our restore function worked, we'll log in again and we'll refresh the page. And we are still logged in. That session has been persisted to local storage automatically to make it so that when your users return, they won't have to log in every time. Additional wallet plugins can be added to support users who use different wallets. The user interface will react and take whatever steps are needed for that wallet to log in. Now that the application has the ability to log in and log out a user, let's start integrating the smart contract. For this, we're going to need to start using the contract kit, which is at wharfkit slash contract. Once that's installed, we're going to use the command line tools again, this time with the generate command. The generate command requires a few parameters, the first of which is the account name where the smart contract is deployed. You'll also need to pass the URL where you can access an API for that blockchain. And finally, you'll pass dash F and the name of a file that you'd like to output this to. If you don't include this parameter, it'll just output the code to the command line. From there, you can copy and paste it into your editor. Once that's run, switch back to your editor you'll see a new TypeScript file that we just generated using the command line tool. This generated code uses WarfKit, both the native types from the Antelope library, as well as some types from the contract kit, to create custom code for the smart contract that it found. A copy of the ABI from the smart contract is stored here for caching purposes, and a bespoke instance of the contract kit itself is created to allow you to easily perform actions and access tables. The generated code will also include a number of interfaces and types based on the ABI that you can use throughout your application. With the contract code generated, let's start building a user interface for it. Let's head on over to the app.svelte, and below the header, we'll create another if statement that checks to see if the user is logged in. If the user is logged in, we'll display a new component and pass the session. We'll import this new component from the todo.svelte file, and we'll go ahead and create that. The first thing we'll need to do with this component is accept the props that were passed in from the parent component. We'll import the session type from the session kit, and then use svelte syntax of export let and allow the session to be passed in. Now, let's put a form on the page with an input element. It's just text. The name of it's going to be task. It'll have a placeholder that asks the user to describe the task and state that it's required. Now we need to hook into the onSubmit event, and we're also going to prevent default. We're going to make it so whenever the form is submitted, we call a function called addTask, which we'll define next. The addTask function is going to be an asynchronous call that accepts an event. We know that the event target is going to be an HTML form element, and that's what we're going to need to get the values out of it. Then we'll use the form data class, pass in the form to extract the data from the form. Then, from the data, we'll get the form field value of the task. If we didn't end up with an event target or a task, we're just going to return here. At this point in the function, we have the data that the user's entered, and it's time to start assembling the smart contract action. Now is when we'll make use of the generated code. We'll import the contract from our new contract file, and we'll instantiate the contract so we can use it. 
The parameter that it requires is an object, and we need to pass in an API client. Luckily, the session has an API client that's already configured that we can just pass here. Now, with the contract instance established, we can use it to create the action we want to perform on the blockchain. The first parameter that action requires is the name of the action you want to perform. Since we generated that code based on the smart contract, it's going to be intelligent enough to know and suggest what those actions are. For this, we want to add the task. The second parameter that is needed in the action call is the actual data of the task, which also is smart enough to know which fields are required. Here, with the autocompletion, we can see that an author and a description is required. The author of the item can just be whatever the session is, the actor field, which contains the account name of whoever is logged in. The second field it needs is the description, which we know is stored above as task, but we do need to convert this to a string. This completed call to the action method will fully form an action that is capable of being included in a transaction. Now, with the session, we can call transact and pass the action in the object as the action parameter. We can await this, and this will request that the current user's wallet sign and broadcast this transaction to the blockchain. If successful, the last thing we want to do is just reset the form. With this code, we now have enough to submit a transaction to the blockchain. Let's switch back to the application, and you can see we now have a text box. If we add a task and hit enter to submit the form, We'll see the transaction performing and submitted. We don't yet, however, have any logic to display the tasks that have been submitted. Let's jump back into the code and add some methods to load that data. The first thing we're going to need is a local variable to store all of those tasks. For this, we're going to create another Svelte writable store, this time with the type of to-do row. This types is exported from the contract kit again, and this to-do row is based on the data from the smart contract. And here, we're just defining it to begin with as an empty array. Now, let's create a method that loads this data from the smart contract. This will be another asynchronous function called getTasks. For this, we'll again use the generated code we created and the contract instance and call the table method, which allows us to access the tables of the smart contract that contain all the data. The first parameter this function takes is the name of the table as a string, which again is automatically populated since the generated code knows everything about your contract. The second parameter, which is optional that it can take, is the scope of the table that you want to load. This table was designed where the scope is that of the username to isolate each user into their own to-do app database. So here, we'll pass the session.actor once again. Now this call will return an instance of a table and doesn't actually fetch data until you call a secondary method on the table. We can chain these methods together, and since we want all the data, we can just call all on the table to retrieve the rows. Now, with the rows loaded from the table, all we need to do is set them to the store. All of this can also be collapsed just into a single line of code. Now we need to call this function. We'll again use Svelte's onMount call and just call this function when the page loads. We'll also go into our addTask function, and when the function call completes, we'll also load all of the new tasks after a short delay. This setTimeout method with a short delay is rather hacky but we're going to need to use it a couple times in a few of these functions. The reason we need to do this is that we need to occasionally give the API some time to process the transaction so that the table state will reflect the changes. Now that the tasks are loaded, let's display them in the user interface. For this, we're going to use an each block. This is the syntax that Svelte uses. Again, we are accessing the store we have created with the dollar sign to get the value, and we're going to iterate over each of them and call them task. Since this is TypeScript, and we have defined the store to use the type that was defined in the smart contract, each task that we iterate over will actually be typed as a to-do row, and your editor is going to know what fields are available to it. For each task, we're going to create a grid. The first thing we're going to put in that grid is an icon that indicates whether the task is completed or not. If the task is completed, which is equal to 1 in the database, we're going to put the green checkmark emoji. If the task is not completed, we'll put the hourglass emoji. Then we're going to put information about the task itself. 
we're going to display the task description that the user entered with the date that the task was entered right below it. Then we're going to create some placeholder data that we'll use in a future chapter. We will also add an else statement into this for each loop for when there are no tasks, we'll let them know and then give them instructions to get started. And finally, just some CSS to make this look nicer. Now the data should be loaded in the application. We set up the store for the tasks to load all of that into state, a function to use the contract kit to get that data. We're performing it whenever the page loads. At the end of us adding a transaction, we are also loading those tasks, and then a loop to iterate over and display them on the page. If we jump back to the application, we should see our task. And we see our task. If we reload the page, we'll see it load the task on page reload. And if we create a new task and submit it using enter, we will also see it load in after that short delay. Now that we can add tasks and view them, we need a way to control them. So let's jump back to the code. The first thing we want to do is make it so that you can mark a task complete. For this, we'll make a new asynchronous function, and we'll call it set task complete. It's going to take two parameters, the ID, which is just a number, and complete, which is a Boolean flag, indicating whether or not the task is complete. We're again going to access the contract object and call an action on it, this time set complete. The second parameter we'll pass is the data for this action, which includes the author, again set to the session's actor, the ID, which is the ID that was passed in, and complete. Then, just like before, we'll call session transact and pass the action, and again, a set timeout that calls get tasks with a short delay. Another method we're going to need is the delete method. For this, we'll define another function, this time called delete task, and all it will take is an ID. Once again, we'll use the contract object, and this time we'll call the erase method. The data we'll pass in, again, is the author that matches the session actor, and we'll also pass the ID. Then, just like before, we'll call session transact and pass in the action, and again, set timeout with get tasks after a short delay. Now we'll head back down into the HTML and find our controls. We'll add a delete button and call delete task passing the task ID. We'll also just add a description to the button. We'll also add an if-else statement, and we'll check whether the task is complete, whether it equals 1. If it does equal 1 and is complete, we're going to add a button that says mark incomplete, and it will set the task complete status to false with the ID. In reverse, if the task is not complete, we'll add a mark complete button, and we will call set task complete and set it to true this time. With this, we now have the ability to mark tasks complete or incomplete, as well as delete them. Let's head on back to the application and check it out. You can see that buttons have been added to each task. And if we click one of the buttons that says mark complete, the task flips over to be completed. If we mark incomplete, the task flips back over to be incompleted. We can also delete tasks, which removes the tasks from the data in the smart contract. All of this is happening on the blockchain. If you flip over to a block explorer and look up your account, you can see all of the actions being performed against the smart contract that alter this data. This to-do app is a rather simple application, but it goes to show how quickly you can create things like this. At this point, it's a functional to-do app. There's plenty of improvements to be made in the UI and also some improvements we can make on the smart contract side. One of the things we've done with this smart contract is take advantage of return values, which is a way that a smart contract can return data when you submit a transaction. If we jump back to the code, in the add task action, we can get rid of this set timeout function and use the return value instead. With the set timeout function removed, we need a different way to get that data. We're going to get it from the response from the transaction. To do this, we'll get the result from the transact call and we'll check to see if the returns value exists. Then we're going to iterate over the returns value as a return value, and then we're going to take our task store and update it by pushing in the data that is returned in the return value. If this were just a normal array, you could just push the value in, but since this is a Svelte store, we have to go through a bit more complicated of a step. And that's it. 
we've just eliminated an API call, and now we're using the return value from the smart contract method in order to update the data in our application. Not all smart contracts support return values. They need to be updated in order to return the values like we see here. But if the smart contract you're working against is your smart contract and you can implement return values, it'll improve the user experience because we can remove that delay and actually return the data needed to update the user interface. This is one optimization of many that could be made. All of the actions in the smart contract could be modified to have return values that help improve the user experience. The tables could be optimized more in the smart contract, more features could be added, and in the front-end application, we could add additional wallets and plugins to make it more accessible for users using other blockchains and other wallets. Feel free to use this to-do app and experiment with any of that on your own. With a basic understanding of how to use Wharf now, you should be able to set out and create an application of your own. For more details on how all of Wharf functions, visit the documentation. Here, you'll find a breakdown of every class, function, and type that Wharf provides. This is all broken down based on which kit it's in and its primary function. In addition to that, the website also has a number of guides. These guides focus less on how Wharf works and more on how you use Wharf in your application. And if you have questions or you want to interact with other developers using Wharf, one option is to head over to GitHub, where we have the GitHub Discussions board on the WarfKit organization, or you're free to join us in Telegram. The post pinned to the top of the discussion board has links to the various Telegram communities that are active. Thanks for taking the time to go through this tutorial with us, and we really look forward to seeing what you can build.